So here's how this week went. I, I saw that every single three years that the Pericope set of Bible lessons that we have works through different readings every third year. Every single third year, I, I preach on Luke chapter 24 that's coming up. I love it so much. And so I thought, I'm going to maybe preach on Acts chapter 2 here this morning. But along the way, I decided I can't not talk about Luke chapter 24. So we're going to do half of the sermon encouragement here and half of it at Luke 24. So listen in on Acts chapter 2, and then we'll hear some words of encouragement and direction based on this. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. And then a little later in the chapter we hear. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. <coughs> For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, that all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, Savior. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of our God. So evaluate this. There is a certain amount of confrontation that occurs when Jesus is brought up. Now I'm not thinking of I'm not thinking of when Jesus is simply dismissed, but when he's actually really considered. Then people People have to weigh some challenging questions. You and I have to, to think of this every day, right? Why did he come? If it was on a mission to save us, then that means that there's something, something wrong with us. The people who walked the streets of Jerusalem so long ago were brought face to face with this. Flashback in time to 50 days before what we read in, in Acts chapter 2. Festival goers were streaming into the city of Jerusalem for the Passover. They, they couldn't have gone without seeing or at least without hearing about the gruesome spectacle that occurred on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. Soldiers hammered nails into the hands and feet of this man sentenced to die. And some at the scene wept and others at the scene mocked and gloated. What heinous crime had this one done in order to receive this type of punishment? That this wasn't just an ordinary criminal, common criminal. Those that knew anything about the recent events, the current events that had occurred around Jerusalem and in Jerusalem over these past months and years knew this man had done all sorts of miracles. But just who was he really? And why was he there? Fast forward 50 days to the day that we have on record in Acts chapter 2 in front of us. And again, festival goers were streaming into the city of Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. And suddenly, as they're gathered there, this great sound of a wind occurs and people, crowds, gather to see what's going on. 
And the followers of that man, Jesus, were talking about him. Why? And did we hear this right? But they're, they're talking in the languages of all the different peoples that are gathered here from all these other places, and, and the people understand? Then one of the men stood up, and people quieted, and they, they listened. He looked and sounded like an ordinary Galilean fisherman, for that is what he was. But what power in his words, and what a, what a change had occurred. From seven weeks earlier, when Peter was was cowered away in fear, and now he's standing in front of us in the streets of Jerusalem proclaiming this news about Jesus, and he's not alone. The other disciples are there in the streets as well. And what's it all about? It's about, it's about that man, Jesus. Why? Who is this Jesus? Well, Peter explains for them, and we heard there in Acts chapter 2 how he was accredited by God to you. Peter cites the miracles that Jesus did to, to show he was accredited by God to you. And Peter goes on to talk about how the things that happened to Jesus in Jerusalem happened, but with God's set purpose and with his foreknowledge. And just as those words had time to sink in, then Peter proclaims this news to the people, and you killed him. Something Peter said to the people that day, gathered in Jerusalem, on this day recorded in Acts chapter 2, is the truth that we and all people of all time have to confront. You killed him. Peter said it to those gathered in Jerusalem that day, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, but we want to answer, what does this have to do with you and with me? These Words thunder through time down till they strike our ears today. They are words that force us to face the truth about ourselves. You and I killed him. What? I wasn't there. You, you weren't there in Jerusalem when Jesus was put to death. What does that mean? It means something is terribly wrong with each one of us. Sin. Sin is so serious that something had to be done about it. This was the reason Jesus came and was handed over according to God's set purpose and with God's foreknowledge. You or I, when we're confronted, we may, we may shrink back from, from wanting to think about ourselves as murderers, but you and I cannot deny the anger-filled thoughts that have gone on in our minds or the anger-filled words and actions that have come from, from us. You or I may want to think more highly of ourselves than when we see the disciples abandon Jesus as he goes to his cross for us. But which one of us can say that we have always been faithful to the Lord and never gone along with the crowd and thought of only our own interests while leaving behind our God? Although our wrongs and they might not be on a public display as what the crowds in Jerusalem did at the time of Jesus' death or the disciples' failures. We see our sin. We know it and, and we admit it. And, and God knows all of it too. God's word, God's word still speaks to us very directly with words like we find in Romans chapter 4, Jesus was handed over to death for our sins. You and I must confront and acknowledge the truth. It was for our sins that Jesus was there. Ignore this, blow it off, try to, to not deny this, or cover up the need for Jesus' work on our behalf, and your sins would still remain chained to you and drag you down to hell. But listen to the word of Jesus, and what, does it, and what does it mean for you and me? Jesus says, I lived and died to free you from your sins and from its guilt. Trust in me, my perfect life lived for you and my suffering and death to take your death sentence. It's, it's all for you. And so everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. How can... How can Jesus offer so much? How, how can I be sure that that is true? Peter shared the facts. Miracles and wonders and signs 
fell from his hands to verify from God who he is. He is God. Even greater than the other miracles, the majority of Peter's sermon on Pentecost was spent on this greatest of all miracles, Jesus' resurrection. No other man in human history raised himself from death back to life. Jesus did, for death could not hold him, we're told here. There's a picture with that description. Death could not hold him. It's picturing a, a guard or a, a soldier, an officer, who can't take custody of him, who can't keep him held. That's what death is pictured as. It can't hold him because he is God the Son, and he lives victorious over sin and death. Dear Christian, look to Jesus' resurrection. It is the assurance to us the life he lived and the death that he suffered means forgiveness and salvation for all who trust in him. And so Jesus' resurrection also means that you and I have the comfort of knowing every day our guilt is taken away and we have no reason to fear. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen. All right, we're ready for our next Bible lesson. And our Old Testament section for today is Psalm 116. Hear the words of encouragement and truth here. Let's speak the words responsibly. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death. My eyes and tears and my feet from stone. That I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The other Bible lesson before we go on to the sermon message with the other half of our current encouragement time with messages. Um, we got 1 Peter in front of us. You're going to hear about God judging and judging impartially. Um, that's all based on Jesus, right? And you go on to, to hear the message in this section. Um, he redeemed us. He paid the price. And so everyone who trusts in his life and death is free from sin and assured of the certainty of his life. Some encouragement from 1 Peter. If you call on the Father, who judges impartially according to the work of each person, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, not with things that pass away such as silver or gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. This is the word of our God. We've got our next hymn of praise. Before we get to our last Bible lesson, some more encouragement. Let's sing him. If you're following the hymnal, blue hymnal, it's 447, or it's projected up for you.
that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and... He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the good news of our God. Please have a seat. These two disciples were seeing Jesus with ever greater clarity as every mile passed on their way to Emmaus. But it wasn't because they knew the identity of the one walking with them. You just heard how they didn't know his identity until they actually got to their destination and he broke the bread. Their greater clarity about Jesus came from seeing who he is and what he has done as told in the written word of God, the scriptures. This is the place to come to know God and know Him better and to understand all spiritual truth. This Bible card is, is so important and so powerful for us because it teaches us that very fact. It's a fact that undoubtedly is, is taught, it's found across the length of the Bible, but maybe in no other place is it seen in as concrete of a narrative where, where it's these people walking and having the truth unfolded for them as the scripture is actually taught. Maybe nowhere is it, is it seen in such a narrative, vivid way as right here in this account in front of us. Just step back through the account with me. The two disciples were searching for direction. They were, they were exploring spiritual truths and issues of eternal relevance, but answers and, and understanding were escaping them. They were, they were disoriented. They were in the dark, and they weren't finding the way out of the dark. Their hope seemed lost. Let's pause with them at that point. 
right there. And let's think of an example to drive home the importance of what Jesus shows them and shows us next. The importance of, of what we learn next. So, I heard this last week, an example of how, how someone had come through a, a scuba diving instruction course. All right? And at the conclusion of their scuba diving instruction course, they were taken out for a night dive. Now, it's obviously different doing a dive at night, and they explained how they had a light along, but, but whatever light they had, I don't know if some lights are stronger than others, but whatever light they had, they described it as the light only shone for a very short distance in front of them, and, and everything else was just complete darkness. Well, in the midst of that, they described how at one point they became totally disoriented. And they didn't know which way was up and which way was down, and they were terrified. Now, they lived to tell about it, but after that event, they explained how they didn't know if they would ever go scuba diving again. Until, until they were told there is one sure way to know which way is up and which way is down if you get disoriented. You look for the bubbles, your bubbles, whichever way the air bubbles are going, that way is, that way is up. And so think about this, the change for that person from being in a situation where there was disorientation and hopelessness to having a reliable source for direction, a way to eliminate the confusion in future dives. Okay, we turn back. We turn back to the disciples where we left them on the road to Emmaus, disoriented, in the dark, lost. Jesus taught them the one way to have an absolutely reliable source for, for correction, for direction, an absolutely reliable source to eliminate all confusion spiritually. Think of how many times in life we face situations where we get disoriented, where we feel in the dark, where we're, we're lost. Think of where understanding about something spiritual escapes us. Sometimes the ways that we are disoriented, disoriented involve where we need some correction, where something where we are thinking or holding on to is off track from God's truth. We may get disoriented by cultural views which seep through into our thinking and into our hearts that parallels the disciples on the road to Emmaus. There were all sorts of cultural ideas about the Messiah that were off track, and it appears that these disciples had, had, had drawn on some of those opinions of others. Now think about today's popular opinions, cultural views about different topics. Topics like what's appropriate in relationships, or what do, what do we need for material things compared to contentment, <laughs> or what are, what are priorities in life, and where does self get elevated too much. But there are many ways that we get pulled off track if faulty ideas from our culture around us seep into our thinking and into our hearts. But it's not always influences from outside of us that get us disoriented. Think about things like dealing with loss and dealing with grief can get us all, all churned up inside and confused. Again, this paralyzes the experience of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus' answer to us is the same one that he brought to the disciples on their way to Emmaus. He points us to his word. He, he shows us, here is your absolutely reliable source for clarity, to clear up spiritual confusion. He points us here and he assures us, everything here is true. You can count on everything you find right here. You have the answer here to how to be right with God. You have here the answer to how to have life eternal with me, your God. Look here for the knowledge which you lack. Accept here the correction that's given from these words. 
the correction we need each day of our lives. I give you here the forgiveness of sins, which you find nowhere else, only in me, and which you cannot live without. It's all yours. It's my gift to you. It's yours through faith in me, says Jesus. And with that comes the certain hope of everlasting life with God and also comfort for all our days through life now. On Easter, that's what we have in Luke chapter 24. On Easter, the place that Jesus is found repeatedly taking his disciples to is his word. He tells us to go to the same place. And as we do, he brings us to know him better. By his news here, God grows our understanding and confidence in him and in his love for us. Jesus, who is God, became flesh, became fully human, and was willing to be wounded to the death for us. But he didn't remain in death. He rose victorious, and that shows us he lives never to die again, and he's promised eternal life to all who trust in him. And he's ruling over all things right now, and he's working in all things for our good, just as he has said. So when... So when grief or loss come in our life, and we, and we have his truth, we have his truth here to clear up confusion that we might, we might feel in our hearts about, about whether he still loves us or about whether he's still ruling over all things and it's fitting with his plans. He does still love us. Everything is still according to his plans as he fulfills his ultimate plan for us. The challenges, the pains, and the turmoil in life are to be seen in the light of the God who loved us so much. He came and he saves us. These two unwrote to man started in confusion on their journey. But by the end of it, they were no longer confused. They were certain. They were no longer sad. But they were joy-filled. They were no longer hopeless. But they were hope-filled with faith resting on a sure foundation. This time that Jesus spent with these two on the road to Emmaus was life-changing. And life-changing is what we experience too. As Jesus takes us right here, we find certainty, we gain direction, and we gain confidence in who our God is, what he has done for us, and just how much he cares for us. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue.